Um, hi, um, we're here today with Lusa Rocatini of um, DSAT. DSAT um, how are you doing today? Fine, thank you. Very well. Um, so, um, what is DSAT's mission? So, DSAT is not just a regular uh, CubeSat. It's a, it's a small satellite. It's a very reliable satellite that we are going to launch in a few weeks. And that will be the first satellite ever removed from space via a controlled uh, system. Uh, it's a demonstration on how it's possible to remove satellites from space uh, without impacting, let's say, the cost for satellite operators and helping uh, like new space sector to understand that this, you know, space is a, is a resource for the human being. Awesome. So um, why is it um, important to um, clean up space junk? Yeah, this is a very good question. Actually, uh, the space junk issue was stated uh, the first time during the 70s when we had only very few satellites in space. Uh, a, a NASA scientist named Kessler started studying what could happen if we keep sending in space satellites without taking care of them, without properly dispose them at the end of life. He ended up uh, with a simulation that actually was quite scary. But you know, at that time in the 70s with very few satellites in space, no one was really concerned. I remember when in uh, 2010, so like almost 40 years later, I was working at NASA in California and I was talking with uh, a colleague of mine about space debris, space junk, and uh, he told me, Luca, you don't have to worry. Uh, we all know space debris, but you don't have to worry that the space is big. And I suddenly understood that actually we need to do something because if the main institution worldwide uh, in Europe, in US and the, and the companies are just focusing on make money out of satellites without thinking of the future of the space business, that was the right moment to, let's say, find the spot, find the solution and help the whole industries to do something about. So I founded the company developing the first decommissioning system able to remove the satellites. And it's actually, this is the system that is installed on the DSAT mission. Um, what if we don't remove satellites from space? Uh, uh, what could happen? So according to several simulations, so now we don't have only the, the Kessler simulation, it's, it's, it's named Kessler syndrome. We have many different scientists that actually are running simulations on a, on a weekly basis. And the situation is, is quite dramatic. So uh, imagine these objects fly in space at, a third, uh, at like 20,000 miles per hour. So even a small piece of satellite, big like a piece of paint, can destroy a satellite. So they are very dangerous. And when two satellites collide, uh, they generate fragments. And these fragments can uh, go around space and uh, hit other satellites, generating more and more fragments. It's a bit like uh, in the movie Gravity with, with Sandra Bullock and George Clooney. So the, the, the scenario is pretty similar. So the, 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 the the catastrophic scenario is the complete destruction of all the satellites around the Earth. Uh, and also the, the, the situation will be so dramatic that we could not send more satellites in the near future for, for decades. So uh, this is a, a big problem for all the companies and entities and research entities that are willing to send experiments and satellites in space. But it's actually even a, a, a worse uh, problem for us here on Earth. Uh, space looks like uh, a science fiction thing, but actually space is here. So 70% of the technology that we use day by day comes directly or indirectly from space. So today, emerging countries are able to, to grow uh, faster because of satellite te technology. Imagine how, 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 much, I mean, how much time and how much money it would take to create a ground infrastructure in the center of Africa or you know in the asia pacific so it will be very expensive but very difficult they use daily satellite technology to in the day by day life to even to pay for their food 
Today, thanks to satellites, we can have better food at the lower cost, even in areas in which it's very difficult to grow food. We can find water under the oceans. We can monitor natural disasters and help to prevent them. So space is a very important resource, and very few on Earth is aware of the, the, the benefits that we are receiving from space. So losing satellites is not just losing the, the space assets. It's not just the damage for like the big corporations that are making billions out of space. It's a problem for all of us. So our idea with the Dishat mission, mission is to send a message that it's possible to do something about. It's possible to prevent these catastrophic scenarios and it's possible to continue doing business in space in a more sustainable way, uh, disposing properly each satellite at the end of life. Awesome. So um, what will the capabilities of your CubeSat be and um, what can you tell me about the experiments you'll be including? Yes, so uh, so we, we are not uh, alone on these satellites, although we, we manufacture the satellite uh, on our own in-house, we include two important experiments on the satellite. So I will start from the experiment and then I will explain you how the satellite works. Uh, so the first experiment is a, a, an emergency uh, protocol uh, signal that we are going to test. So basically, um, in case of natural disasters on Earth, uh, like the, se the cell phone lines are not working. So uh, thanks to this protocol, you could warn population uh, under this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, in these areas uh, impacted by the natural disasters like earthquakes or tornadoes or uh, hurricanes. Uh, you can you can reach uh, reach them and send them instructions. So like place where to find food or where to find shelters and so on. So we are going to test for the first time this protocol. And it's likely that if the test is successful, this uh, uh, entity that is called uh, CNIT is going to apply this protocol to the new uh, satellites called Galileo. It is uh, the, the very similar to the GPS satellites that, that US have, uh, have in space. It will be the European GPS satellites, let's say. So to provide this service to everybody in, uh, like around the world. The second experiment is uh, it comes actually from a private company. This private company uh, developed a, a system that is able to send a warning signal to airplanes uh, when an object re-enter uh, from space. And uh, even if it looks uh, kind of like a, a weird, uh, a weird uh, task, uh, one day, uh, one object per day re-enter into the atmosphere from space, and there are several tons of material every week that re-enter into the atmosphere. So the uh, aeroplanes are really uh, in a dangerous situation if, if they don't know where the objects are, are going to come back. So currently, the technique that is used is to send a warning uh, for a very large area. However, it's very difficult to uh, stop all the flights in such a huge area because they had the, the, the stopping all the flights will have a huge economic impact. Uh, so this system allows to send signals directly to the airplane in the proximity of this area in such a way that they can avoid the area and save fuel. So, uh, so this is what we are going to test when we are, we are going to re-enter. And the third experiment is actually is uh, our decommissioning system. It's uh, an intelligent motor that we have installed on the satellite. It's completely independent from the satellite. So even if the satellite is not working, uh, uh, this decommissioning motor is able to, to function properly. And at the end of this mission, so after about four weeks in space, we will send a command to, the, to this uh, intelligent motor, and the intelligent motor will uh, provide the trust necessary to uh, slow down the satellite and put it in a, a re-entry trajectory that we decide uh, in order to make sure that the satellite is going to end in a very defined area uh, on Earth. The satellite, uh, since the satellite is small, uh, it will burn uh, completely uh, during the passage through the atmosphere. However, if anything uh, would survive to this re-entry, it will land exactly where we decide uh, it should land. 
The satellite is uh, uh, it's very similar to what you find in uh, large satellites. So we uh, work a lot uh, in research and development to create uh, uh, inside a small satellite uh, the same reliability architecture that you can find in big satellites. So DSAT, it's a zero single point of failure. This is, uh, let's say, the technical term, uh, terminology that we use. It means that it's a fail safe. So whatever happened to the satellite, it's completely redundant and we can still use the satellite. So uh, it, it's, it's, very, it's very good in terms of, uh, of uh, reliability, as I said. And it's, uh, it, this, the very same technology that we use inside this uh, could be used in the future also for other small satellites that will be launched in the, in the space market as well. Awesome. So um, where did the idea come from to create the first self-decommissioning satellite? <laughs> this is a this is a good question. Let's say that um, my goal uh, as a founder of the company uh, was always being to go to go to space. So I planned all my life to be able to become an astronaut here in Europe. And so I study a lot, too much. Uh, you know, I have like a PhD in space propulsion, a master in enge space engineering, a master in robotics, in uh, in, in software. Uh, I have a, a master in strategic sustainability and also a, a certificate in business. So a lot of studies just to get to gain uh, enough uh, points for the astronaut contest so i went through the whole astronaut contest but at the very last selection there were only four places four seats uh, among 10,000 applicants uh, i was discarded basically uh, because of my psychological profile it was the very last uh, the very last test uh, so i'm, I'm you know, I, I'm too crazy to become an astronaut. So say, okay, so if I'm really crazy, I will be able to build my own spaceship and go to space on my own. I have, you know, I studied a lot. I have a lot of expertise. So why not, uh, let's say, <laughs> get back some benefits from all these studies? So I, I decided, okay, but uh, if uh, it will take a little bit longer, you know, if you become an astronaut, you can go immediately into space. But if you, if you are not an astronaut, then it can take like a few years. Uh, and then the space debris problem appears to my eyes. I said, okay, but if no one is going to solve the problem of space debris, no one is going to space, neither me. So that, that's actually a, you know, an issue for me. I said, okay, we need to solve the problem of space debris first. And then studying the problem, I realized, I said, okay, but we cannot just solve a problem here because if you solve a problem it's basically reducing the impact of space debris but if you reduce space debris you are not really uh, uh, getting rid of them we need to think in terms of a scenario in which space debris are not there anymore you know we need to change the the, the way you think about i said okay so how can we create something that allow us to put the whole space sector into a scenario in which debris are not there so I elaborate these uh, like very easy and very logical three steps. The first one is to make sure that whatever we launch in space can be removed 100% of the time in a safe way. So without damaging other satellites and not, uh, without uh, damaging anyone on Earth. The second step would be to go and retrieve the junks that are already in space. And the third step is to start recycling directly in orbit all the raw material that we have to produce new material to be used directly in space for building new satellites and spaceships directly in space. So, of course, uh, some of these steps looks like science fiction, but you know that science fiction is the science of tomorrow. So it's, we can start from today and uh, I, I focus on the first step and realize this intelligent motor. So this intelligent motor that you can install on satellite is able to remove satellites even if the satellites are not working. So when I said 100% of the time, it's, this number is very important. Today, according to regulations, uh, uh, only 90% of satellites are allowed to be removed. Uh, so if you reach 90%, that you know the governments and the like the institutions are uh, are happy. However, today the average it's about 50% of satellites being successful on the on the disposal maneuver. So we are very far from 90%. And even if you apply the 90% rules, you still have a, an increase, a slow increase of the brain space. So you are not really solving the issue. With my system. 
doesn't matter if the satellite is going to be alive or not at the end of its life, my system will be alive and will remove the satellite at the end, at the end of life. So the reliability of my system is 99.997%. So it's not 100%, of course, because it doesn't exist 100%, but it's very, very close to 100%. So this is, uh, 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 let's say, the story of how, you, how, you, how I, I created the, the, the device and why the device is so important because once the debris are gone, then everybody can, you know, for a much cheaper price can go to space. Imagine the increased cost that uh, a spaceship could have if they have to increase the protection for hosting people on board. Now we, we hear uh, that Elon Musk want to bring people around the moon. There's Richard Branson with, uh, uh, with like bringing people in a suborbital space. And there's uh, like Beagle of aerospace. They want to build warehouse in space, like hotels in space. Imagine how cheaper it could be if they, they could avoid completely the problem of space debris. So this is a very important aspect. So this is why I decide to focus first on that. But keep in mind that the technology that we find on the, our decommissioning system is actually a, a technological platform that could be used in the future to go ahead on these three steps that I mentioned before. So, but let's say, at the moment, we need to start from the step one, and then we will move to step two, and eventually step three. Awesome. So, um... I understand you're currently running a Kickstarter campaign to raise funds for this mission? Yes. Um, actually, we are not really uh, running the campaign to raise funds in the meaning that we already invested in, the, in the, the, the whole mission. So the mission is already paid. We thought that it was uh, very important to share the message, uh, what we are doing, that uh, debris are preventing the satellite infrastructure to be created uh, in the space for the future, not only for space, but also for the whole humankind. Uh, natural disasters could be prevented, uh, so, like food, water, there are probably the most important problems that we have on Earth could be addressed by using uh, space in a proper way. So we thought it was important to make people understand that today we have a solution that could immediately be adopted by all the satellites that are going to be launched. So the idea was to say, okay, if we go, if we just put a post on Facebook, there will be probably, I don't know, like thousands of people that will read the post, but five minutes later, it will be gone because, you know, it's, Facebook is very, very quick. Uh, if we write an article on a newspaper, even that, like probably millions of people will read it, but still it will last one day. So why not putting all together all the, all the communication strategies and also using a crowdfunding campaign? So with the crowdfunding campaign, we, we are really focusing on the crowd part of the crowdfunding. So if uh, one person put one dollar in the campaign, for sure it will follow the whole mission up to the end. It will become part of our team. It will become a sort of sponsor. It will tell about uh, other people, friends, about the mission, about the problem of space debris. And when everybody will be aware of the problems, so there will be not only the orbit thinking about solution. There will be other companies finding maybe even better solution than what we are proposing and working on the field and uh, helping the satellite operators to find the best solution possible. So this is our missions. We believe that the crowdfunding campaign could be a good instrument, of course, not alone, together with uh, many other communication tools, uh, to promote this message. On top of that, uh, we, you know, it, Whatever we are able to raise, uh, we, will, we will use to uh, keep the experiments that we have going. So to further develop the technology that can uh, help uh, like the disaster monitoring and the, and the warning for uh, air flight uh, signal. So uh, it's, not, uh, it's not compulsory. We don't really plan to reach the threshold or to make uh, money out of it. Because uh, uh, like our mission alone costed uh, about a million, uh, actually a little bit more in dollars, so uh, more than one million dollars. So this is a very negligible amount, but still, whatever we are able to raise, we will make a good use of that. Awesome. Um, well, that's um, all the questions I have. Um, anything you'd like to add? 
Um, let's say I would like to uh, to stress the fact that um, space is important, not because the orbit work in the space domain, but because in the future we will see, uh, let's say, a, a great use of this new natural resource. In the last decades, we sent in space 800 satellites, and <coughs> sorry, and in the next decades we are going to send. 23,000 new satellites, so a huge amount of satellites. And if we don't uh, start doing business in space uh, in a more sustainable way, the risk is that everybody will will suffer from that. Not only the space business, but also the the, the, the Earth business. The the last uh, the last comment is that uh, it's not related to space. It, it's a general uh, a general point. Uh, most uh, most people think that uh, becoming sustainable means uh, spending money, that uh, decreasing the pollution or avoiding the emissions of toxic gas in the atmosphere, it, it, it's, it's costly and is actually uh, cutting away the competitive advantages of the company. And I strongly believe that this is wrong. Actually, uh, if one company or one private person plans in advance uh, his actions towards sustainability, it will have competitive advantages on that. So when we design our systems, not only this, not only the D3, the, the, the commissioning system, but all the systems that we, all the products that we design, we take into consideration what will happen in the future. What will be, are we going to create problems in the future? Uh, if the answer is no, then we, we realize it. There are some materials that we know that in the future could create some issues and probably they will be abandoned. They will be, you know, by regulations, you, you cannot use it anymore. So if I plan in advance uh, to become sustainable in these terms, I will not face any issue. I will keep selling my products and actually I will gain market share. The companies that are sticking with, to the old business, they will face you know, sooner or later, someone will knock at their door and say, you cannot do this anymore. And we know, you know, from, from the history, it happened several times. And those companies, it's likely that they will go bankrupt or they will not, you know, they will have to spend money to fix all the technology, the products and, and the plants that they already have. So uh, this is just an example. Today, it's really possible to take advantage of a good way of becoming sustainable in business not spending money, but saving money. And this is a great competitive, competitive advantage in every type of business, not only in space. Awesome. Uh, well, uh, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. My pleasure. <laughs>